So during my second talk I would like to focus a little bit on the effects of environmental pollutants and risk mitigation strategies. I'll give you examples for that. First of all, once again, a little overview on what we know from the literature regarding effects. There's not many studies that have been published that really looked at effects, for example, of insecticides on aquatic systems. In total, up to 2004, there were 42 studies published. There's a few more that came out since 2004. But still, out of these 42 studies, there were, at the end of the day, if you look here on the uh, bottom right information, only seven studies out of these 42 that really showed a clear relationship or claimed to show a clear relationship between the exposure of insecticides measured in the field and the effects on, for example, the abundance or the density of organism, the organismic drift or the community composition. And it's interesting to look at a couple of these seven studies a little bit more closely. For example, here one study looked at uh, azinfos missile contamination and found uh, 0.2 microgram per liter azinfos missile for a few hours in a surface water and 50% of the mayflies present there uh, showed uh, mortality and then when the same mayflies were tested in the laboratory with azinfos missile it became clear that the 24-hour LC50 is 1.4 microgram per liter. So that means basically that 1.4 microgram per liter of azinfos missile are necessary to kill 50% of the mayfly population but in the field you can see a 50% mortality already at 0.2 Asian, uh, microgram per liter azinfos missile, so at a much lower concentration. In another study, a similar picture, 10 to 48 microgram per kilogram and the sulfen were found. There was a strongly reduced abundance of uh, mayfly species and the 10-day LC50 is 162 microgram. So these mayflies should theoretically only die at 162 microgram if exposed for 10 days to this concentration, but they show in the field already an effect at less than 50 microgram per liter if exposed only for a few hours. And many other studies showed a similar picture, so overall that means using the toxicity levels from field studies, from simple laboratory studies, cannot really help us in explaining what we see in terms of effects in the field. And there might be many reasons for that. One reason might be that in the field there are still other compounds that may contribute to the effects or that there are other factors like other abiotic factors contributing to the effects. Although all these studies listed here try to avoid these other so-called compounding factors or it might be as a conclusion that the um, sensitivity of the uh, ecosystems in the field is simply just higher and therefore we cannot use laboratory systems to predict what is going on in the field. And there is some reason to believe that this latter aspect is uh, true, which ob obviously means that many uh, traditional laboratory-based ecotoxicology data are only of restricted value for predicting what is going on in the field. If I if we take a look now again at the situation in the Lawrence River in South Africa and conduct with the concentrations that I showed you in the other talk that we measured in the Lawrence River, uh, what uh, uh, potential risks we may assume, then you can see here a list of the different insecticides in the lines of this tables, the table, the uh, peak concentrations that we measured in particles and water, and then on the right hand side of the table the observed effects either on the individual level, the population level, or the community level. And you can easily see that effects occurred, for example, here at the individual level for Azinfos missile at 78 microgram per kilogram, but we measured in the field concentrations up to 502 micrograms, so more than factor 5 higher. Or for Chlorpyrifos, there were effects at uh, 95 microgram per kilogram and in the field we measured 340 microgram per kilogram or in the last, in the lowest line there were for the total organophosphate insecticides community effects at about 200 microgram per kilogram and in the fields there were concentrations found up to 5 
thousand microgram per kilogram. So this indicates that for various insecticides the concentrations that were present in the field in the Lawrence River catchment were much much higher than those concentrations causing negative effects on the individuals, populations or communities. And that means basically that when we see all these effects and these relatively high concentrations it is pretty well recommended to think about uh, risk mitigation options which are really applicable in the field and which help to, to solve uh, this situation and to help to reduce the toxicity and to reduce the environmental effects. And we uh, had a look at these mitigation uh, of uh, uh, chemical risks and uh, using the example of insecticide in the aquatic environment I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. There is two main entry routes, the spray drift and the runoff and both entry routes depend on a variety of uh, parameters as listed here and as I said uh, both spray drift and runoff are important in the Lawrence River catchment but mainly runoff leads to a, a very high concentrations as you have heard in the other talk about exposure. So if you look a little bit more at the situation of runoff then uh, there's one thing that is very very important to note. We have something like a kind of a hydrological dilemma. This is illustrated here by this, illustrated here by this graph. If you look here on the x-axis at 10 millimeter rainfall there is about one millimeter of this 10 millimeter rainfall that is uh, leaving the site or the area if it is a loamy soil area as so-called surface runoff. And if you now increase the rainfall from 10 mm just to 30 mm, so by a factor of 3, then the amount of surface runoff increases at the same time by a factor of 10 to 10 mm out of these 30 mm here. So you have a very, very high amount of uh, rainfall that is leaving a loamy soil as surface runoff during strong rainfall events. And that means it's very, very hard to retain the water on the plot and it's pretty uh, recommended to think about how the surface waters, once the pesticides have entered and the runoff have entered these surface waters, how they deal with the pesticides and how they can potentially be used, the surface waters itself, itself to mitigate the contamination. And what we looked at was aquatic plants, aquatic macrophytes growing in the surface waters as a kind of a uh, a local low-cost solution for cleaning surface water, uh, uh, surface waters when they contain pesticides and therefore for mitigating the risks of pesticides. So here in the Lawrence River catchment we had the situation that one tributary was originally flowing directly in the Lawrence River and about 10 years before we did the study they were building in a wetland here, a constructed wetland into this tributary and the tributary was flowing through this wetland which was largely covered with aquatic macrophytes and we looked here at two sites, the inlet site and the outlet site, what contamination we found and therefore looked how this constructed wetland may contribute to reducing contamination which occurs here at the inlet site either due to spray drift or due to runoff from the orchard area which is discharged by this tributary. So during spray drift we found here for Asinfos mesal, which is the most intensively used insecticide in this catchment, average inlet concentrations of 0.6 microgram per liter and average outlet concentrations which were roughly a factor of 10 or about 90 percent lower. And for the Asinfos mesal load, so the total amount of Asinfos mesal, the reduction in the wetland which can be equalized with the retention capability of the wetland was about 54%. So for both concentration and load the wetland seems to work pretty well in reducing the Asinfos mesal uh, associated uh, risks. And for runoff we had a similar situation. Here you see one of the strongest runoff events that we ever monitored in the Lawrence River catchment and uh, there's for three different insecticides the concentrations at the inlet, the, the shaded bars and the outlet and you can also see that pretty high concentrations appeared at the inlet but the concentrations at the outlet were once again by at least a factor of 10 lower than the concentrations at the inlet. So also during runoff these constructed wetlands work, work very well in reducing the pesticide concentrations. And they work even better for 
particle associated insecticides. We measured these with uh, particle samplers uh, which were installed at the inlet at the outlet of the constructed wetland and although we found pretty high concentrations of different insecticides at the inlet, we never found these current use insecticides at the outlet. So there's more or less a 100% reduction of the current use insecticides in these um, constructed wetland in uh, South Africa. And this then uh, also can be displayed as a reduction of the toxicity in the system. Here you can see during times of no spray drift and spray drift in the left graph and no runoff and runoff in the right graph what the uh, uh, mortality of uh, test organisms is. What we did here is we used caronomids, an insect species, a larvae of caronomids and exposed these larvae in situ in the, in the inlet and the outlet site. So they were basically uh, put in small boxes and were exposed there in these boxes and the water of the stream was flowing through these boxes. So we could count after a while how many of these organisms were surviving. And what you can easily see is that during both spray drift and runoff there's a pretty high mortality up to almost 50% at the inlet side but this mortality is reduced to about 5% at the outlet side. So once again there is a reduction of about a factor of 10 also in the mortality and not only in the concentrations. So that shows that these constructed wetlands containing vegetation can help tremendously to reduce the concentration of insecticides but also the ecotoxicological risks associated with insecticides in surface waters. So let me summarize this. Effects were detectable at the individual population and community level. Mitigation measures are required. Edge of field runoff is can be uh, mitigated obviously either via avoidance of runoff at all, but that is uh, due to this hydrological dilemma a relatively uh, difficult thing to do. Or aquatic plants, aquatic macrophytes can be used within the agricultural streams, within the receiving streams as a kind of um, a treatment system, a natural treatment system to reduce the concentrations. And once again the spatial uh, geodata can also help here to support a targeted risk mitigation. You can easily identify where there's areas of high risks and then implement uh, risk mitigation strategies particularly there and uh, therefore use the spatial geodata approach also to link it with the data that you have from the field studies and the experimental studies in order to optimize your measures and try to identify measures so that for relatively low uh, costs help a lot to mitigate the risks associated with pesticides coming from agriculture. Thank you very much for your attention and if there's any questions I'm welcome to answer them for you. Thank you very much.